So if it doesn't work in the airplane, why, why even have it? If, if your relationship with God doesn't work everywhere, you know, I even have jewelry on, I'm still anointed. <laughs> okay. All right, so this afternoon, everything is, uh, is kind of shifting, as, as you know, as a pr- the, these, these spirit schools are going to be turning more toward the students in the, the days ahead. So Saturdays, we're shifting. We're going to still do the kids, of course. But if you notice, I'm bringing in other professionals besides just pilots. And I know the, the pilots love to, to be uh, part of this, but we also have other things involved. So we have... As you can see, we had nurses there. All the kids got a first aid kit. Thank you, partners, for providing for that. And, um, and uh, you know, so we're going to be we're going to be teaching the kids a lot of different things, and we're getting them into scenario scenario training for what to do when things go wrong and how they can help the par- your you parents in, in situations that are emergencies, and you know how to handle yourself, so we can stop uh, all this junk that's going on against kids and you know, against the family. So. Yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good to cast out devils and pray over people, but I think your kids should still know how to put a bandage on somebody that's bleeding, you know, and I think that they should understand how to fly the airplane and how to cook. I mean, you haven't even seen Warrior Chef yet. Oh my gosh. We didn't do that this time because it's just, it's, some of these things we do for the kids are, uh, they involve a lot of, of people and my staff is doing the best they can keeping up with this but we have warrior chef where we teach them how to cook how to shop Um, everything is based on making the right decision at the wrong uh, wrong situation make it right so that's why we have the police involved and the fire we're gonna have the fire department we have everything and you're gonna see it shift on Saturdays all you students you ready all you students we're gonna start bringing in uh, people that will help you start a business and um, we're going to have like labs on Saturday for the students, like break away where you can go, whatever, and you'll get course credit for it. You'll get some sort of credit for it for your, your degree. Okay, so we're, it, uh, God is into labs. He's into practical stuff. He's into putting into practice what you learn. He's, he's into that. So we can help you do that. We can do it with training wheels. Right? Okay, so Saturdays will start switching towards the students, and we're going to have a lot of people teaching um, for your doctorate, for your PhD, not your THD, for your PhD. You are going to have to teach a lab instead of me. You're going to teach it on a Saturday, or you don't get your degree. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. So while me, I'm up there in my room eating my burger with Kathy, you're going to be doing the Saturday afternoon session. Well, what's the use? What's the use of going to flight school and never flying? Come on now. The degree on your wall doesn't mean anything unless it manifests, okay? So anyway, you all know that. Um, okay, so today, uh, today you saw the kids. They, we got the first aid in there. We got the, the, the handling of firearms. We got the... Um, the flight stuff and so we got dinosaurs died we got people got bandaged up and we got people that flew flew so we got those kids they got watches thank you partners for supporting and doing all that for us uh, all the study guides all the CDs is all paid for by the partners and and um and then you got your uh, uh, deliverance school will be happening in next hour so you can stay, but they must go. Okay, so it's really clear cut. Okay, so then we're going to have, then, then after, so I'm going to teach now. The, the name of this session is called Where's My Father? And we're going to talk about the father, the father figure. And um, this is going to be another like coffee talk. I'm not going to get real scripture, scripturally, uh, you know, you know, like, like scripture every other sentence. Um, it gets to where you have enough scripture. You, we just need, we just need to talk. We need to have conversations, you know. 
and um, I want to have a conversation with you about the father. Where's your father at? Where's my father at? And I'm talk, talking about just earthly fathers. There's, there's several levels of this that actually, when you, you counsel people, you find out that it's the lack of a father figure in your life. It causes a lot of things, you know? And then you can't handle a father God. <laughs> so you, you, uh, you don't, you're dysfunctional. All right, so we're gonna talk about that first, then we're gonna have deliverance school. They must go, you got that book, everybody got their book? Okay, and then um, you got prayer school. Everybody got prayer school book. So a lot of schools today. Okay, these are yours to keep. If you want extra, you wanna uh, purchase them back there, um, I'll give you the first one free. Um, if you want more, um, I'm making them available to you for a really good price. Okay, all right, so, I will teach prayer school, and then I will hand it over to Kathy, and sh she will pray with you. And she'll, she'll, she'll pray with you the way that we pray together, and uh, I'm going to go up and take a bath. <laughs> and I'll be watching, so behave, okay? So I'll be watching on my phone, so. All right, are you ready? Okay, so with th this conversation about a father, um, I had a conversation with my dad, and uh, I need to tell you, I, I, I need to know when you are all ready to really listen, because I don't, I, I, this is all very important. Everything I say is very important, and it's very strategic by the Spirit. It's, it's to save your life. When the Spirit leads me to teach on certain things and do it a certain way, it's because he knows who's here and what is needed that you need to hear and you need to take out of this building with you. Okay, so I had a conversation with my father and, what, and I wanna tell you that this could, should have happened a long time ago, but it was one of those situations that we get into where God actually forces, he actually starts to, to uh, make it default to his desired uh, situation or, or outcome. Okay, now, do you understand what I just said? Is the Apostle Paul was called and set apart as an apostle before he was born. He was appointed and set apart as an apostle. Now, what does it say? The gifts and callings of God are without... Okay, so it's irrevocable, right? So good luck running from God. If you're chosen to be one of those people... Now this goes against some people's theology, but the bottom line is, is that it went against Paul's theology. And you gotta remember that, that Paul was really smart and he didn't need any help. So at the proper time, when God couldn't deal with his shenanigans anymore, he just arrested him. But he let it go on for a long time. Christians died because of God's grace in Paul's life. Saul. Saul thought he was right. Jesus told his disciples, there's a time coming when people will put you to death and think they're doing God a favor, right? Well, that was talking about Paul as an example. Okay, so people will withstand you, come against you, and resist you, but they're really resisting God. Now, I'm talking about if you're righteous and you're walking with the, the Spirit and you're staying in step, I'm not talking about you getting punished for your own disobedience. I'm not talking about getting something because you, re, you sowed it. I'm talking about sowing what's right and doing what's right and still being rewarded wrong for it. It gets to a place where Paul said later, he said, these people are resisting the ministry of Jesus Christ in me. He actually said that in the translation of the Bible. He said, they are not opposing me, they're opposing Jesus Christ who's doing his ministry through me. So they, it got to where you're resisting God. You think you're coming against a person, but at a certain point, it'll become apparent to the enemy that he is now facing the head honcho, 
Like he's not just coming against a ambassador. The person that the ambassador is representing has now shown up. This is what you want to happen. But there's a time where this doesn't happen. So if you're not established in the idea of who God is, a father, and you haven't had that experience in your life of having a good father, then you have no way to process how God operates. Because your view of him is wrong, and there's not, a, that's the ability to correct that is, is very complicated. You, it has to be shown to you. You can't just read a textbook. So a lot of counseling does not help you. You gotta have somebody that says, you know what? This is forever, so you, you might wanna just behave. In other words, you might just wanna get with it. It's time, it's time for God to have his way. Let's do this. Okay, if you can come to some sort of agreement, the only thing is, is that they're always gonna be working on their relationship. So you're gonna see this struggle going on and people will just flip out, they'll, they'll just leave you, they'll lie to you. I mean, ministers are like, like the best liars. I mean, not everybody, you know that. I, I mean, I'm pastors, I, I was a pastor, I don't wanna be a pastor. Can you imagine being in James Church? The Apostle James at his church? Have you ever read his book? His, I know it's not preached, but I mean, it's actually still in the Bible. I mean, you don't want that guy being your pastor, do you? I mean, you you kidding me? And do you want to counsel with him? He's going to say, you know what? All that junk you're going through, it's your own evil desires within you. You're being seduced and pulled away by your own evil desires. Well, no, that's not why that person came to him, came to him to, to somehow validate them in their situation and pat them on the back and say, it's gonna be okay. But see, you can't say to a person, it's gonna be okay if it's not gonna be okay. So if you wanna go get a prophecy from someone who's gonna say it's gonna be okay, well then you're wasting your time and your money because God's not in that. God's like, if you love me, you'll obey me. So James, he says, listen, you know, you have faith? Can you imagine, imagine him today? Show me your faith. Oh, no, we're talking about this. We're going we're to talk about confession today. No, show me. Let's do, he's going to take you out to South Mountain. He's going to say, go ahead and speak to that mountain. He's gonna have his little Richter scale out to see if there's any earthquakes or anything. No, see, see, that's the way they were back then. They, they forced the hand of the enemy. They forced him to show his hand. There's an edge that we've lost with those apostles. Peter didn't help Ananias and Sapphira. He goes, is this what you paid for it? He didn't coach them. You know your, your husband's dead. You might want to get your story right. No, he didn't say that. He said the same people that carried your husband out are going to carry you out. You know, see, so Sapphira came to the second service, the 10 o'clock service, because of her hair. She had a lot of hair, you know. And so Ananias came to the first service. You know, us guys, we just, you know, it's, it's very quick. I've probably spent in my whole life if you add up all the time I've spent looking in the mirror, it's been about three hours in my whole life. Oh, no, this is, but this is scriptural. Even when God told Moses to build the laver, he said, use the women's mirrors. It just says it right in the Bible. It doesn't say the man's mirrors. Because we can just look in the barrel of our, like off the, the barrel of our rifle or whatever and get, see our reflection. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Everything's fine. We would look at our knife, you know, our knife. Our, yeah, everything's good. We just go like this and our hair's done. I'm sorry. I'll just kind of get you guys to laugh. But the conversation I had with my father, I should have had a long time ago. But see, the thing that, that happened with, with my father was, is that when, I, when Jesus 
appeared to me in the operating room and took me for that 45 minutes, at the end of that, he addressed something that was really bothering me about my father. I always said, if ever, any time that Jesus would appear to me, I was going to ask him what was going on with my father because it was just a mystery to me. The way that he, he dealt with me, the way he acted toward me, it was like I had done something wrong, but I didn't know what I had done wrong. And it was like I, I couldn't in any way convince him. No matter what I did, it was not enough, and it was, I was always wrong. And I thought, you know, um, what, what is it that I, I inherited this without like having any way to rectify it, it seemed. So, you know, I grew up and I'm at Southwest Airlines and I had this operation and Jesus is talking to me. Not, he's not really concerned about, but I'm like, I gotta go back to my earth suit. You know, I gotta go back to earth now. Call NASA, I'm coming back, you know. <laughs> no, don't call NASA. But as he left, he left through this door, this bright door. I remembered, hey, I got to ask him about my dad. Like, what went on with my dad? And he was still alive. But I, I always had all these unresolved issues about my father. Like, and I couldn't understand this. So I, I went, I go, oh. And all was left was his foot. Everything else had gone through the glory of that door. And I saw his foot come back and step back because it was like a ship compartment. He had to step into it as a portal. He had to step into it and he disappeared in the glory. So he came back in and he peeked through and he goes, oh, about your father. He heard my thoughts. He said, it's not your fault. And I woke up crying, I started crying, and I was sucked back into my body through my mouth like I went in like a sock over my foot, I just went like that. And I woke up on the table crying, and that's all I needed to hear is it wasn't my fault. That's all I want, it, was, it somehow resolved everything within me. Okay, so that happened. I'd never told my parents about the operation they couldn't even handle me being a Christian at the time because they thought it was a cult. So I left for college and I did everything I did. They could see that God was with me and they knew something had happened, but they weren't ready for all this stuff. And they don't, they don't necessarily believe like I do. But over the years, the Lord won them over and they all got saved and all my family got saved. But it was a long process of watching manifestation they were watching God work in my life, and that was what convinced them. So I didn't say anything, but it wasn't even a month later that I got a call from him. And he said, I, I just want to apologize to you. He said, I wasn't a good father. And he said, I was really hard on you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you were really hard on me. You beat me every day, you know, but I didn't say that. And he started to explain that it was transferred to him and that's how he was brought up. And he said, we didn't have a manual on how to be a parent. And so he said, I'm sorry, you were the first child and we didn't know how to, it, he said what came out was what my father did to me. So whether it was nothing or something, that's what came out. So if there was neglect, it's because he just do, doing what he was taught, okay? So he started to cry. And I said, Dad, I love you and I forgive you. And so we said, we, you know, we talked and then I hung up. Okay, then another member of my family called me and they said, you know, they don't know anything that just happened to me. And it was years, Kathy knows, it was Thanksgiving dinner one year before my dad passed that I actually told them what happened to me because I knew they weren't ready. They weren't ready for something like that. But I told them, we told them at Thanksgiving and we could feel it on the way over there, we could feel that year, and it was so sacred when we were sitting at the table, and um, the, the power of God was so strong, 
It was just, it was just us four. But somebody in my family had felt that they should talk to my dad about this. And so I didn't know that. And she, she felt like she should do this, but it was because of what Jesus had just said to me. It initiated this whole thing in the spirit. So it, it caused this to come to a head. So that's what really happened. That's why he called me, but he didn't tell me everything. He just said, I'm you sorry, and explained that part of it. But what, what I found out from this family member who talked to him, they actually confronted him about all the things that happened in our home. And why did you treat Kevin like that? And it was known at that time, not to me, I didn't know why. But I was told, well, they didn't know whose father you were. And my dad thought it was the other guy. So that was what was going on, the whole growing up. And it's way more descriptive than this. I'm just giving you this type, I'm trying to show you how this all happens so you, you can understand it, is that We found, you know, obviously I was his and not the other person, but it appeared at a certain point that I was the other because of certain things that were characteristic. And now it's obvious when you line my whole family up, we all look alike. I mean, my sister is the female version of me, you know. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. We're only, you know, we're only 10 months apart. So, where's my father is, is, a, is the, the question that we, we really are crying out inside of ourselves is that we want to be able to connect with our lineage and, our, and, and have an inheritance and have a transfer. And Satan is after that. So what happens is, is you, you are dysfunctional. And, and no one will be brave enough in your life to sit with you and say, listen, you have a wrong image. And so because of that, your character, you're, you're having, you're get your every, if you, if you sit in counsel with people, even professionally, it all comes back to this, this very thing. And it comes back to rejection and how we process trauma and, and all the things that happen in our lives, we try to process it. If we don't have the proper father image, then we're, there's a deficit, it doesn't go away. And God wants to fill it, but we don't have any tools within ourselves to process this. So that's why I watch, I watch people, I watch my best friends, I watch family members literally marry the worst situation but it was, it was a toxic thing where the, 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 the women were tr attracted to, to the very person that their father was, which would be like, he's not come. I mean, I was like, my friends, I would say, you're no, no, you're not marrying that person. That's, that's exactly why you are what you are. This is, I've watched these people marry the same person, not the same person, but the same person three times. Okay, it's because of the father image, that's what you're attracted to. And I'm like wanting to take a ball bat to these people. Not to the, the victim, but to, it's like, no, just stay away from her. Don't, no, no, we gotta like, we gotta stop this. It's gotta stop. The cycle has to stop. See, the inheritance that was Abraham's was given to his son, and then it kept being transferred down. When it got to Jacob, he had to be coached and told, and practically the daylights beat out of him, in order for him to conform to the inheritance. He defaulted to it. He accidentally found himself at Bethel. He should have known the inheritance was there at that altar that his grandfather and his father had built and honored. Everybody listen to me? 
Okay, this is what should happen in the families. You should have an, a spiritual inheritance that's given to you from your parents. It should be transferred down so that it's three easy steps instead of 14,000 page biography that everybody's crying when they read it. It's like, you, you gotta be kidding me. It's three easy steps. There should be a transference down and it's not being done. And so people are attracted to the wrong person. And I heard this all the time. I heard this all the time. The reason why females wouldn't be associated with me is because I was too good. I was what, too good? What does that mean? I still haven't found the answer. They said, well, we gotta handle you with white gloves. It's like, well, what does that mean? White gloves? I had no idea. What it was is that I was not the framed image that they had of who they wanted to marry. I said, I guess they wanted me to go out and kill, kill an animal and skin it or something, you know, and beat somebody up, you know, and go drinking with them or something. You know, it, what, that's what I'm trying to say is, is that's what they were trying to tell me, is they couldn't do the things they want to do with me. That, that I didn't fit into that. I was too good. So I thought that everything is a commitment. If I'm going to lead somebody to think a certain thing, that's a commitment. And how far do I want to go with this and everything? I don't want to lead people on because that's what people do. And after a while, that's why you all want to just stay home and have your snacks and watch TV. It's like because you're over people because you get, it gets too complicated and you're just just waiting for the revelation of each relationship on the fact that they have an agenda. And you're waiting for the revelation that it's going to turn out bad. After a while, you're like, you know what? And that's the way it is today. Okay? With my father and that relationship that, that wasn't there, it was based on the fact that he said it was handed down to him this way and that's how he did it and he, he admitted he was wrong okay but i'm already damaged so jesus has to say something then family members have to confront and say what is going on here and then we find out the real reason why was it because of infidelity and they didn't have the tests they have today where i would say well just do a lab test but but you know stop stop this I'm a person, you know, so I was always asking, where is my father? Because there was all these questions about it, and what it was is all of us don't know how to fill our role because it wasn't handed down. Okay, so this is why it's so important is the reason why the church is not where it should be is because the family is not where it should be. And each individual is not where they're, it's, they're shifted a little bit. So you don't have your connection with your father. And so your family suffers. And then the church suffers. Because the church is all about families being together. So you have this, this dysfunctional thing. And then you have the dysfunctional people teaching the Bible. And so then their theology has babies and then you have so you have copies of copies you know you don't you don't have legitimate men and women getting the real thing like fasting and praying and working extra and giving your money away that kind of thing like are you sacrificing for someone else constantly and you lose your own will and it's 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 no longer you that lives it's Christ in you. And we can tell because you really are living a, a, the life of Jesus Christ. You can see it. You're not compromised. You're not greasy grace. 
You're not excusing your actions. You're displaying Jesus Christ. Okay? If I didn't see Jesus Christ in my family, then how am I going to have a family and represent Jesus Christ? It's going to be a lot of steps I'm going to have to take on my own. Okay? So all of us are in a deficit, but we need to have this conversation this afternoon without a whole bunch of scriptures because you know all this. But the bottom line is deliverance will come basically by you understanding this about a father. Did you know that the demons, actually a lot of demons reside and, and torment people, Christians. They torment Christians because there is this deficit of understanding about the father. So growing up, you were neglected. You were abandoned. You felt abandoned. You feel re rejected and abandoned and neglected. And so you think that marrying somebody is going to fix that. So you end up in the hospital after marriage. No, in, in other words, you end, up, you end up in a worse situation because the person can't fix you because that's not what they're called to do. No, I even, I got to be careful because everybody's watching. And all these people are watching. So I have to be really careful. But I have been told, well, I'm going to marry for money the first time, and then I'm going to marry for love the second time. That was the whole agenda. No, no, this is not hearsay. I was told this. Thank God. There was a puff of smoke where I was standing because that was the last day. No more dates. Because I know where I fell. I didn't have money. I was, a, I was making $11 an hour. <laughs> so I guess I'm round two maybe if I, for real love, right? Okay. This is actually true. I mean, there are people in this room who know who this person is. But I saw this all the time, and then I started to see it in ministry. I saw the same thing mirroring how people were treated and how people thought. It was this, if you, it, you know, because I would ask questions and I was listening. Most, most ministers, didn't, they had a terrible upbringing and no father present. Brother Hagen. Oral Roberts, you can just go down the list, all abandoned, single parent families, disease, almost dying of disease. A lot of the healing revivals were all based on men and women that devil tried to take them out, and then God used them in the healing revival. But, you know, until you've, you sat in class and heard Brother Hagen sob, over the fact that he didn't, he missed that father image in his life. It, you, you got, you got to, it, it still affects me today to hear him sob. A man who has changed so many people's lives and yet he never had, his, his father abandoned him and his family when he was little and he had to pick it up. He had to pick it up and be the father for his mom. Okay. Then, to see, I mean, I'm not making any of this up. It's not a story. It's not something I was told. I was there. I watched this happen. Then I watched him and his son. I'm not going to tell you everything because we were asked never to share it. But I guess I am a little bit. But <laughs> I don't want him coming after me. But there was like this confrontation type thing going on and we were we were there where the spirit of the lord hit brother hagan and he went he called his son up and i want to tell you that was 45 minutes of intensity because he just confronted him in front of us all and there was a come to jesus meeting 
father and son. I think I might be in trouble, so I'm going to be quiet. Yeah. But these things you walk away from and you think, okay, ministry is not what it looks like. Because your favorite minister, a lot of them are struggling with, with really bad physical things right now. They don't, because they're word of faith, they don't want to tell you that they're taking in insulin. Because that, that wouldn't represent Jesus Christ. Well, it's like, yeah, but then all of you out there thinking, well, they are in health and I'm not. And I'm listening to the same word I gave in the same offering plate. See, it, it doesn't help us because there's not a transference. Is this okay? I need a snack right now and, and a hug. This is the hardest part of ministry. I never thought that I would be the one to have to stand up and say these things. I never thought that would have to be this way. So where's my father? See, I didn't have that, so how could I receive from God as a father if I don't have that frame of mind? So I married, I married God, I married Jesus Christ, but I can't function in the marriage because I can't receive because I'm dysfunctional. So God can't fix me. Now, he could, he could arrest me on the road to Damascus. And that's what he'll do at the end if he has to, like with Paul. But that's not his perfect will. His perfect will is for Isaac to receive from Abraham and, and Jacob to receive from Isaac and then Joseph. And then you have Israel, you know, you have the whole thing going on. It was a transfer down. That's the way it's supposed to be. The whole idea, whether you like it or not, is that, and that's the way I'm doing it here, worrying us. It will be transferred over. I'm doing everything. Like what you see is just a small drop in comparison to what I have in the archives for for the next generation, all these, all the, all my leaders, their children will take over. It is set up so that Warrior Notes will run forever. Because I got to correct for generations that didn't do the right thing. The way it's supposed to be is you're supposed to be transferred an inheritance that you live off of. So like, the Wingates, their university should run forever. They shouldn't have to be, only have two hours of sleep and actually not take their salary and have to let people go. That, there's an inheritance that God wants to give to an organization so that it runs forever. But what happens is, is don't tell Dr. Wingate, but people cannibalize. People cannibalize the ministry. We, we had this pump. I haven't lost my way. I'll get back onto my thing. But we had this pump. It was a well at my grandma's. We had a big farm, hundreds and hundreds of acres. We all had houses, and my, my family, my, we built up on the hill with the farmhouses down there. And um, there was a pump, and uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a can of water there. And it says, do not drink the primer. Because you had to put that in and prime the pump to create suction. Is everybody f uh, 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 following me? So you can't, dr you can't eat your seed. You have to plant it. Because so, you won't have next year. If you want to just have a loaf of bread now and then you're going to die, then you do that. If not, you, you, do, you just portion it out and you plant. Then you have a hundredfold harvest the next year. Then you can start eating. Okay, so you didn't drink that. Because if not, then you had to go get water to prime the pump so you can get water out. So once you prime the pump, you can have a, an, an unlimited supply of water. But if you drank what was there, it was not designed for you to have that. That's the tithe, but you don't want to get into that. But because, you know, people get offended and then they'll leave. No, but the, the thing about cannibalization is, is that 
people want to take their part in the generation they live in. They just want to like cash out. Well, what happens if you do that, then it doesn't leave anything for the next generation. There's no primer, and then there's no inheritance to hand off to your kids. And so I tell all the staff, listen, I'm, I'm thinking about your kids here. They're going to get paid. They're going to have books to publish. I'm going to have so many books in the archives ready to publish that you can publish one a year. It would take 50, 60 years to, to publish them all. I'm going to have courses that won't be released until 20 and 30 years after I'm gone. But the whole idea is you don't eat your seed that you need to plant and you don't drink the primer. Okay, so if God started the university and did what he did through them, then everybody that's involved should be giving into it, not taking from it. So what happens is, it's the weirdest thing. It's supposed to, it's, it's all set up wrong, it's mafia, but you pat me on the back and then I pat you on the back and then we just, you know, it's, it's a mono mono, you know, we got, a, we got, a, you know, we got an agreement here. And so it's this tight knit group of people that just keep patting each other on the back. It, it's a tight circle, so you can't get into it, but once you get into it, you gotta pay to play. You gotta pay to play but then you get it back. Well, that's not the kingdom. Okay, so the kingdom is God sows into your grandfather and then he produces a crop and he sows into your father. Then your father produces a crop and sows into you. Then you don't eat the seed. So what's in your driveway? No, I'm just kidding. So you don't eat that. You you create a handoff and an inheritance to the next generation so that it stays effective and potent. This is how God is. God placed everything into Jesus Christ and then gave an inheritance. The inheritance is we are fellow heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So whatever he gets, we get. That is because of the father figure and the handoff that Jesus didn't opt out by doing something on his own. He did only what his father told him to do and obeyed and sowed himself for us. Then we inherit everything that the son of God inherited. The only thing is, is in 2000 years what we haven't done is we haven't place the baton in the next generation's hand in a favorable position, in a favorable manner. We should own everything by now. We shouldn't be owned. We should be the head, not the tail. We should be lending, not borrowing. Okay. How long have I been going? How long am I going? Do I got another 10 minutes or do I need to go on to the next thing? Where's, huh? Where, where's everybody at? What time did I start? Huh? Already? I've gone an hour? Oh, that's it. An hour? Okay. All right, no use of arguing over it. Um, so, You have to accept Father God as a God who wants to give good gifts to his, his children because that's what Jesus said. So you have to see if you're going to ask for something. He's not going to give you something terrible like a snake. And that the goodness of God, that revelation of the goodness of God leads people to, it, to repentance, not preaching the fear of hell or damnation or punishment. See, you should obey the law because you're a Christian, not because you're, you fear your driving record <laughs> you, you, or you're getting caught. That is not repentance. Being sorry because you got caught is not a good reason, okay? 
All right, so we'll end with this. My father called me right before he passed away. He got cancer, we prayed. We rebuked the cancer, he got healed. A couple months later, came back. He called me. He didn't know he had it back at the time. And he said to me, I just, I just need to tell you something. He said, you have no idea what you have done for me as far as my relationship with God. And he said, it's because of you that I'm a Christian. He said, you showed me God by your life. You didn't preach it to me. You showed me. He said, everything I saw, supernatural events. And he said, that is why I'm a Christian. And he even told us that in front of Kathy, he said that. He, he started crying, he pointed at me and he told Kathy, he goes, it's that man right there is the reason why I'm a Christian. Because he lived it. Okay, so a couple weeks later, he's in a coma. So I, I fly in to see him. He's been in a coma. So they, they didn't, you know, they're, they're, you know they're, the world's thinking a certain way. So it's like, just sit there on the bed with him. We all, the whole family gathered around and he's, he's in a coma and he woke up. And he looked right at me and he got to spend time with us. He was just waiting for us to come and then he passed away that night. Okay, uh, Ryan's not with us, but Christine's here which is Mike's wife, Christine and Ryan, our brother and sister. And so pray for Mike because he's got a really hard you note. Know. <laughs> but um, Ryan and Christine's mom was our head intercessor. I actually hired her to be our head intercessor. And to make it really short so we can, you know, I need you to get this. But there, the handoff was is that Ryan and Christine's father uh, was, was, in, was in war and uh, got, got some things that happened because of the war. He passed away early, rare, really early. And so essentially it was, it was just mom, Connie, was ahead of the household and So Ryan and Christine grew up without a dad. Okay, but Connie is, a, is an amazing person. So Connie calls me and says, you know, it doesn't look good. And they're saying, you know, I got this much time. And I said, no, I'm not letting you go. And I'm not, you know, I need, I need you here and I'm not letting you go. I said, no, we'll pray. And um, so we... We prayed, uh, we prayed, it was interesting. We went and prayed with, you would know who this person is. You would know who both people were. We just went to dinner and um, we, said, we said, you know, did the same with my father, did the same with her. We all prayed. Okay, so she passed away, went to heaven and Jesus said, you gotta go back. And he sh the people that we were praying with in their garage, that you would know, well-known ministers, he said, they won't let you go. You gotta go back. And name the people that we were actually with. Saw us holding hands and saying, no, Lord, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let him go. So she, she called me, a little upset. No, <laughs> but she, she said, you know, were you praying with so-and-so? Which is, you know, nobody get, get to talk to these people. But we were <laughs> in their garage after dinner and I said can you just pray so we all prayed and and I said yeah that did happen they go well I'm back so a couple months later I think it was I might be getting this wrong please forgive me but she called me again and she said I'm tired it was Sunday night I'm tired she said it's just time for me to go and I go are you sure she goes I just I'm I'm, I'm just I'm just done she goes, but I have something to tell you. She said, she said uh, 
you keep your hands on the wheel at Warrior Notes and you look straight forward and you never give up, you never back off, and you never apologize for anything. She said, she started to repeat, because what my dad said, when he called me, he says, you have no idea. He started prophesying to me. He said, you have no idea what you're doing in the world. You are doing it, and God sees it. He said, never stop, never give up, never back off. The exact same word for word what Connie told me. And she passed away within hours after that phone call. My dad did too as well, the same exact thing. See, the transference still happened at the end. Do you get it? You have to be willing to ride it out. Are you willing to ride it out? Most of you don't have a chance to encounter the real father figure on the earth because it's, it's, just, it's just not possible now. So you're gonna have to reconfigure the way that you look at God. And I'm telling you by the Spirit of God that you need to do that now. You need to look at God as always being for you, not against you. Always thinking the best of you. You realize that he's gotta be committed to 1 Corinthians 13, just like you do. He keeps no records of wrongs. He thinks the best of everyone. Don't you think that if he wrote that scripture, he's got to act it out himself? Don't you think that he doesn't know what you're talking about when you mention your past? Do you realize that Sister Ruth, Sister Ruth sitting right here, do you realize without saying too much, because everybody's watching, but you realize that the Lord said to me, you're going to have to write a book with her. I go, she can write a book herself. She's, she's like an awesome woman of God. She, she could write it and it would just fly off the shelves. He goes, no. He said, no one else is going to help her, so you're going to help her. So I, I called her and I said, we're going to do a book. What do you want to do it on? She goes, the glory. So I said, okay, we're going to do it on the glory. Became a bestseller. But no one, I try to get, no, no, I'm just telling you because, because, you know, I don't really, I do care, but I don't care anymore. But there are, everybody's watching, all the publishers are watching, all the talk show hosts are watching, all the, the all your favorite Christian channels are watching. They, they, they watch me and they, they throw things at the screen. But the thing of it is, is you got a woman who walked it out by herself. A woman in a man's world. She, she, she obeyed God, and yet I can't get anybody to publish her book. In fact, I was told, and, and Sister Ruth, that's why we weren't on this, the shows, I was told that the only way that we, they would have her on is if I was with her. It's like I'm the little genie that they rub their head, you know, to get the... Yeah. We're at the end of the age. It's not going to matter. They're not coming after me. They're just like, right? I'll just throw Dr. Wingate in front of me. He'll leave. No, no the, 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 the idea here is, is that we should all have a handoff. We should all have an inheritance. Sister Ruth Heflin put everything she had into her disciples, and one of them was, was Sister Ruth. Sister Ruth Heflin was served by Sister Ruth Carneal. So Sister Ruth, by serving her, got everything that Sister Ruth had, okay? But no, we want Sister Ruth Heflin. It's like, well, she's gone, but you got the handoff. But it's like, I don't understand, and Sister Ruth knows this, that I just felt like, you know what? At the end of the age, it always defaults to someone who will say yes. And it doesn't matter if they have a father or not, whether they have know somebody at a Christian network or, you know, God can create a pathway in the jungle if he has to. So I honor Sister Ruth. I did everything I can do. I have her on my own talk shows. 
I t- let her talk, I listen, because that's the proper way to handle it. So every one of you should let God talk to you about how you are involved with the handoff. For, for Kathy and I, we just financially supported people. We went to work extra and we, we just portioned sums of money out to give to people that were, were doing this. Now we're in the, in the other way. But we're still sowing into people. Okay, so that is the end of this session and I need to go to the restroom <laughs> and I'll be right back and we're gonna do deliverance school. Amen. Okay, but th- there's one thing. During the break, just leave your invisible friends out there. Are we, this is deliverance school. So you can come back in, but they have to stay outside. Because we're, we're gonna have deliverance, uh, we're gonna have deliverance school, amen? And then we're gonna have uh, Ka- uh, Kathy, Dr. Kathy's gonna do prayer school. 